Democracy Now! This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're on the road as part of a 100-city tour, now at Stanford University in Palo Alto. Tonight, we'll be in Santa Cruz. By the time the next president takes office in January, U.S. troops will have been in Afghanistan for over 15 years. It's already the longest war in U.S. history. Just last week, local authorities said U.S. drone strikes killed 17 civilians. According to the United Nations, the number of civilians killed or injured in Afghanistan has risen to a record high for the seventh year in a row. The United Nations said more than 3,500 civilians were killed and more than 7,400 wounded in 2015. More than two and a half million Afghans are living abroad as refugees. Many have attempted to make it to Europe, where country after country has closed its borders to new refugees. A controversial new EU-Turkey plan has just taken effect, calling for all newly arriving refugees to be deported back to Turkey. Well, today we look at what role the U.S. should be playing in resettling refugees from Afghanistan. We're joined now by Stanford University historian Robert Cruz. His recent piece for foreign policy is headlined, America's Afghan Refugee Crisis. He wrote, quote, over the decades, the United States has not only lack the capacity to fix Afghan society, but has played an essential role in breaking it." End quote. He goes on to suggest the U.S. should fulfill its historic moral and political responsibility and enable the, quote, mass resettlement of Afghan migrants here. Robert Cruz is director of Islamic Studies at Stanford University, author of several books, most recently, Afghan Modern, The History of a Global Nation. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Professor Cruz. Thank you. Talk about what should happen now, the scope of the problem of Afghan refugees, and what is the U.S. role? Well, the United States has, has approached this problem for over a decade and a half now. Um, with some fatally flawed misconceptions about Afghan society and Afghan politics. So my comments about the refugee crisis also extend to uh, really a, a much broader critique of America's approach in Afghanistan itself. I think we've been burdened by this idea that we're dealing with a primitive society, a society that is inherently barbaric and violent, and we fail to see how we, in fact, have shaped the society. We have made it what it has become today. And in fact, our imprint goes back many decades. What can cite our role in the 1980s? What can cite our role since 2001? But really, it's a much broader problem, a whole series of uh, policy failures. I think the most important one is really a failure of imagination, a failure of the acknowledgement um, of our responsibility in, in, in causing Afghanistan to be a place that so many thousands, hundreds of thousands of people want to flee. Why do you think the U.S. should resettle Afghan refugees here? And what would that resettlement program look like? Well, obviously, it's not a very popular policy, given our contemporary politics and the positions of our presidential candidates across the board. Um, but we're a large country. We're a relatively wealthy country. And we have failed to defeat the Taliban. We have failed to create a political order which is sustainable. We have failed to create uh, conditions for any kind of economic stability in the wake of um, what is mostly an American and NATO withdrawal. So I think the United States does have a, um, a responsibility. We've allocated a very limited number of uh, visas, roughly 7,000, to uh, Afghans who served as translators and guides for the armed forces. But to my way of thinking, that's far too narrow. It's politicized the whole visa process. It's essentially, um, I think, actually caused some of those figures to be in greater danger because it's made them um, like even more of a target for by their opponents. And I think um, we have the resources, and I think this is, should be a reminder to Americans that when we intervene militarily abroad, um, to add to perhaps the the um, Colin Powell's um, you know the Powell doctrine, if you break it, you own it. Um, this should be part of the price tag of military intervention. Mm. In December, while we're in Paris covering the U.N. Climate Summit, Democracy Now! traveled to Calais, the largest refugee camp in France, where six to 7,000 people are camped out in makeshift tents. One of the people we spoke to was Najibullah, an Afghan national, who said he'd worked as an interpreter for seven months with the U.S. Marines in Afghanistan, as well as for a number of months with a U.S. private contractor called Creative International. He had applied for a visa to the United States, but was denied. I applied for a immigra special immigration visa, but they, uh, because I was working uh, just for seven months, the U.S. Uh, uh, government refused to give me visa because they said 
uh, you just work for seven months, not one year. And uh, and I and I send a letter from the Creative International Company that I uh, to as a as a evidence that I work with them also. So if we put all together, it be, becomes more than one year. What I am trying to say that uh, working with the youth government. Uh, it doesn't matter you work just one day or uh, a year or two years or f four years. It doesn't matter for, to the Taliban. As long as you work with them just one hour, you're, tra you're condemned to, uh, to death. So that's what happened to me. I was condemned to death. And uh, I'm asking the U.S. government why they, you know, refuse me to, uh, to give me a visa. And that's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. I'm facing this difficulty. That was Najibullah. We met him in Calais, a refugee camp known as <clears throat> the Jungle, the largest refugee camp uh, in France. There was an entire section of the camp um, that Afghan refugees camped out in, Robert Cruz. So he worked, Najibullah worked for the U.S. Marines. Uh, he worked for this contractor, Creative International, yet he could not get a visa to come to the United States, despite the fact that he said if he had worked one hour for the U.S., uh, the Taliban would condemn him to death. And that's what happened. Right. I, mean, I think it's clearly a, a betrayal. But I would add that for many Afghans who are caught in the middle, caught in the middle between Taliban and Afghan National Army forces or those who fall victims to American drone strikes, which persist, or to other airstrikes, like the one you cited in the East last week. Um, many more Afghans beyond this class of people who have served the military, I think, are also entitled to some kind of um, redress, because they are living in circumstances beyond their control, but very much shaped by what we have done there. Well, what about this policy, um, that you have to have worked for a full year or you won't be protected? I think, actually, it's now been uh, extended to um, a term of two years. Um, two years. But, but the numbers are, are still quite, quite minimal. And if one looks beyond this special uh, visa program, the number of Afghans who are admitted under other conditions is extremely um, very, very few. I mean, actually, just a few hundred people who have been admitted uh, per year in the last four or five years. I want to ask about comments by the former CIA director, Michael Hayden, on drone warfare in a New York Times uh, opinion piece in February headline, To Keep America Safe, Embrace Drone Warfare. Hayden writes, quote, The program is not perfect. No military program is. But here is the bottom line. It works. I think it's fair to say the targeted killing program has been the most precise and effective application of firepower in the history of armed conflict. Hayden goes on to say, quote, Civilians have died. But in my firm opinion, the death toll from terrorist attacks would have been much higher if we had not taken action against, again, the former head of the CIA. There's a lot we can say about that essay, and I would recommend that your viewers and listeners read it. There's a bit of poetry there, which is um, quite remarkable. Um, these are uh, military strategies which are also part of um, the deeper story of this flow of refugees. Um, these drone strikes do, in fact, capture lots of civilians. That is, they make um, whole towns, villages, hamlets um, uninhabitable, right? They actually create terror. And Hayden here has mirrored the logic of militants around the globe who have failed to distinguish between civilians and, and combatants. Um, this idea that, that very few civilians are dying, in fact, is, um, is unproved. I think we have lots of evidence to the contrary. And until the Obama administration opens up its books and actually lets us see what's happening, we can only assume that the, the contradictory and countervailing reports are, are, are true, and that lots of civilians, in fact, are dying. And these are creating, in fact, more militants, as, as some security officials maintain at the end, to return to the refugee crisis. Uh, this is part of what is making um, part of Afghanistan and, and, and the northwest frontier of Pakistan really uninhabitable for lots of populations. You have suggested <clears throat> in your writing that um, Afghans now um, trust the Taliban more than they do the Afghan military. I would say that that's uh, some Afghans. So it's some, some Afghans in, in the south um, and in the east, areas where they have faced uh, foreign military attacks, right, uh, airstrikes, and where they have faced abuses at the hands of, of Afghan police, Afghan militia supported by the United States and, and the central government and by the Afghan National Army and police, 
who are often corrupt and who have employed often uh, very brutal methods in these territories. So it's not a, a broad statement that would apply to all Afghans. Um, it tends to um, apply more limited, in more limited ways to people in the South and, and the East. So the program you would recommend, even if it is unpopular, yes. for Afghans coming to the United States, uh, uh, elaborate further. Sure. Um, you know, I think we've done this with populations in the past. I mean, we've done this with, with Iraqis to some degree, with Somalis. Um, here in the Bay Area, we can point to the history of the resettlement of, of Vietnamese populations in the wake of the, of the Vietnam War. I think um, if one looks at those populations, you know, take the case of the Vietnamese or take the case of the Afghans who came in the 1980s, um, these communities have been extraordinarily successful. Well, let's look at the Vietnamese. Yes, sure. After the Vietnam War, UN High Commissioner for Refugees ultimately resettled 1.3 million Southeast Asians in countries around the wor world, including 800,000 in the United States. Sure. I mean, what could be more American, right, than, than opening our doors to the world and, and becoming better for it? I think that um, Afghans would make similar contributions. Now, there's anxiety about a, a brain drain, and some I've had Afghan friends who have challenged my perspective on this, and I, I very much respect that argument. I think that. Um, there are Afghans who, who will and should stay in the country to help to rebuild it, but I don't think that should be a burden that all should have to bear equally. I mean, what do we say to children who are caught um, in the crossfire? What do we say to older people who don't have the means to, to um, participate in this project? I think that, the, um, you know, in the end, there will be interest in this program were it to be inaugurated, but it's not as if all Afghans would leave, right? It's not as if, um, uh, or even just the educated would leave. I think you would get a, a wide swath of people. Uh, but many would become professionals here. They would make contributions. You know, we have students here at our university. In our graduate program, some of our best students um, were once refugees, and now look at them. I mean, they'll be stars in their fields. And I think it's very much an American story that we can we can identify with any ethnic group. And people like Donald, Tru Donald Trump, Ted Cruz, uh, talking about people like these as threats to this country, that um, there should be a ban on all Muslims coming into the United States? Right. I mean, it's a very alarming idea. But in the case of the Afghans, I think um, it, it, it goes more deeply, and it actually has shaped how we fight this war. We imagine, again, that Afghans are, are particularly barbaric and, and warlike and, and bellicose. I think that has um, forced us to make certain decisions in the country, in Afghanistan itself. I mean, this, this resort that Hayden uh, cites here to drone warfare, um, we imagine Afghans only understand the language of force. And that, of course, is, is wrong. And in the, in the book that I wrote that you, that you mentioned, I attempt to, to challenge how this idea came to be and then to point to alternatives. I um, mean, you know, we've misunderstood Afghans. They, in fact, are quite cosmopolitan. Um, they've lived all over the world. They can adapt to circumstances to everywhere, and there's nothing necessarily violent about their nature, right? That's very much a political story that we share with them that goes back for many decades. Well, Robert Cruz, I want to thank you very much you. for being with us. Robert Cruz is author of Afghan Modern, the History of a Global Nation. He's associate professor of history and director of the Soheb and Sara Abbasi program in Islamic studies here at Stanford.